I immediately felt annoyed as I noticed my sister Jenna calling me. Their car should have been at the cabin more than 20 minutes prior, yet I'd somehow managed to arrive there before them. Hey sis, where are you at? I asked, half surprised, and a bit worried that they'd taken a wrong turn somewhere. Which wouldn't have been too out of character for Jenna, with her absolutely non-existent sense of direction. What I got in response was a static mess of sound that blared from my phone at full volume, before it quickly cut off and the call disconnected. Out in the middle of nowhere, it wasn't an uncommon occurrence, and I figured if I drove back down the road, I'd get a few bars of signal. Our lonesome cabin was situated only a three-hour drive from the closest town, in the most desolate part of the country, only accessible by a road that had gone without maintenance for what seemed like a century. To most, it might feel like a post-apocalyptic wasteland, but for us, it was the perfect escape from the noises surrounding New Year's Eve. The plan had been to drive together, but with work keeping me back and them driving ahead, we'd split up. Even then, it wasn't the first time we'd driven there, so she should have known the way. I called Jenna again once I got a few bars on my phone, and once she answered, it became clear how distressed she was. In the background, I could hear her two kids crying, and Jenna doing her best to keep calm. Jenna, what's going on? I asked, my annoyance quickly turning to worry. We... we hit something on the road, she said. What... You mean like a deer or something? I asked. I I don't know. I hit my head pretty bad when we crashed. Didn't get a good look at it. It, it fell into the ditch somewhere. Her voice shook with each spoken word, and whether it be from the impact or a rush of adrenaline, she sounded like she was on the verge of tears. Shit, are you alright? Yeah, I'm just a bit shook up, but... She trailed off. She stopped speaking. I could hear her walking away, trying not to alert her kids to the situation. I, I can't get the car started again. Could, could you please come pick us up? It's dark and the kids are getting scared. Of course. Where are you? At the T-junction on Glover Road, but she stopped mid-sentence, as if something had cut her off. Sis, you alright? Yeah. Please, just come. All right, I'm on my way. I'll call you when I get close, I said. She thanked me, and I hung up. The landscape around me was dimly lit up by my headlights, revealing frozen glass and leafless trees. During the day, it looked like any other winter wonderland, but in the dark, it could bring out the shivers in even the most seasoned adventurer. Once I'd gotten about halfway there, my sister's name lit up on the phone. I slowed down to a halt and picked it up, not willing to drive and talk under these circumstances. Hey, what's up? Are, are you far away? She asked nervously. I'm about halfway. Won't be long. Why are you calling? She paused for a second before responding, breathing erratically as she mulled over what to say. Eh, it's just that. She trailed off. What? The thing I hit? It's moving. The thing? You mean the deer? No, it's not a, a, a... It's something else. I don't know. What? I don't know. Please, just hurry. Confused as to why she called me a second time, and annoyed that I would have almost been there if not for the disturbance, I hung up and kept driving. After a few minutes, I pulled onto Glover Road and continued towards the junction, I put on the high beam to make sure I didn't accidentally crash into my stranded sister, or whatever she had collided with herself. As I arrived at the junction, I saw no sign of a crash, and realized that despite my sister's instruction, she might be on the wrong road entirely. Keeping me company was nothing but the cold, and an old wooden sign that read Glover Road, with Jensen Street coming up from the junction. I sighed and called my sister for a third time. Jack? She said, sounding absolutely terrified. Yeah, I'm here already, but you're not, I said. You sure you broke down on Glover Road? She didn't respond, but I could hear her trembling breath and crying kids on the other end of the line. Sis, you okay? It got back up, 
she whispered in shock. What did? The thing we hit, it got back up and ran off into the woods. What was it? I don't know. I, I couldn't get my flashlight in time. It was too fast, but it, it was tall and it, it ran on two legs. It didn't look like any animal I've ever seen, she said. While the forests in the area were known to house many strange creatures and bizarrely large elks, nothing fit the description my sister had just given me. Though what irked me more than the strange animal she'd hit were her whereabouts. Hey, Jen, let's do a video call. Then you can show me your surroundings and I'll come pick you up, I said nonchalantly, trying to keep her calm. Okay, but it's pretty dark and my camera sucks, she responded. We turned over to a video call, and she brought up the flashlight to give me an inkling as to where she was. Look, here's the sign, she said as she pointed her camera towards an old wooden sign. Glover Road, Jensen Street, the sign read, just like the one I stood next to. Wait, that doesn't make any sense, I said and showed her the same sign on my end, proving that we were in the same location, yet couldn't see each other. But... Where are you? She asked. I'm literally in the same spot as you. I don't understand, I said, a hint of fear showing through my voice. Look, I'll just call the police. I don't know what other option we have. Just stay by the car and I'll call you right, I said before I was interrupted. No, wait! She practically yelled on the other end. She pointed her camera towards the tree line her flashlight barely reaching across the road, creating nothing more than a pathetic outline of the trees and something moving between them. Do you see that? She asked. Is that the thing you hit? I asked. Before she got a chance to answer, the figure shot out from the trees, becoming clear in the light. There it stood, ten feet tall, a bizarre mixture of animals merged together with bones protruding through its pale skin. Its face was nothing more than a mangled lump of flesh poorly fitted to its body, and in the center lay a massive hole, resembling a disgusting mix between a mouth and a singular eye. Oh God, what is that thing? She yelled. It let out a broken roar before it charged at my sister, crossing the distance between them in just under a second. She pulled back towards the children, grabbing onto Laura, her two-year-old, who had inexplicably gotten loose from her seat and shoved her into the car. As she turned to help Alex, the creature lunged past her, grabbing onto the ten-year-old and snatching him away within a second. No! Let him go! Alex! My sister yelled, but the thing had long since retreated back into the woods. I quickly glanced over at the tree line, from where the creature came, but on my side it was empty, a world occupied by nothing more than darkness. Whatever separated my sister and I, it wasn't distance. Help! She called out. Alex! I... I'm going to call the police. Hold on. I hung up and dialed the number. No response. I checked my phone to make sure I still had two bars of signal, yet no connection could be made. I tried a second and a third time to no avail. Help would not come. After the hopeless attempt, I called Jenna back. J Jack, she stuttered as she picked up. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't get a hold of them. Are, are you alright? We're inside the car, but... But there's more of them now. They're circling around us. <laughs> they took Alex. She got out between sobs. Just stay in the car, Jenna. I'm going to drive down the road and look for help. I put my phone down on the dashboard and kept the call going, talking to Jenna as I sped down the road, promising, lying that everything would be alright. Jack, they're... they're leaving, she exclaimed with the faintest hint of relief in her voice. I let out a breath, slowing down my car a bit as I let myself believe the worst had passed trying to avoid another unfortunate collision. That's great, Jenna, but stay in the car until I get back, I ordered. But Alex, he's still out there. Look, I know it's hard, but Alex, he's... Before I could finish the sentence, something could be heard in the background. It was her son crying, 
It was her son, crying and calling for help. But something about his voice was off. The emotion in his calls was practically non-existent. His cries were unnatural, as if they were nothing but a poor imitation of a human being. Alex! Jenna cried, opening the door without hesitation to go out and save her child. Jenna, no! I yelled, but it was too late. She'd already stepped out through the door, and no sooner did her foot hit the ground before one of the creatures bounced onto her, snapping her arm in half. She dropped the phone, and in the struggle, I could hear the car door closing with Laura still inside, while Jenna was torn to pieces by the horrific creatures. I kept driving against my strongest desire to turn around and help, but I knew that I could do nothing to reach her, no matter how hard I tried. Jenna, I yelled, but the call had long since disconnected, leaving me alone in absolute silence. As I sped down the road, I kept trying to call the police, but no matter how strong my signal was, I couldn't reach anyone. Even while going far over the speed limit, it took an hour and a half to reach the nearest little village. Once I drove into a more populated area, I managed to flag down a police car that happened to pass by. While what I told them was mostly an incomprehensible mess of words, they managed to get the gist that someone was hurt, including a child. I headed back towards Glover Road on board the police cruiser, while I unsuccessfully tried to reconnect with Jenna. After two hours passed driving down the icy roads, and once we got there, I was more than surprised to be met by their wreck of a car. Jenna and Alex were nowhere to be seen, but in one final act of defiance, my sister had managed to lock the doors from outside, preventing her youngest, Laura, from getting out. The little girl sat crying inside the car, her entire world shattered in the span of just an hour, as her entire family had gone missing. The police did a thorough search, but couldn't find the remains of neither the monster or Jenna. As far as the evidence showed, they'd never existed on that road. Whatever I told them, it was limited to what I'd heard on the phone call, and Laura being too, had little she could say as much as she wanted her mother back. Had my sister not decided to leave early, and work not kept me late, we might have driven the same car, and all of us could have either been fine, or died a horrific death together. I wish there was more to this story, that I could have given you all a happy ending, but instead I'll just leave you with these simple instructions. If you ever break down on Glover Road, Stay in your car and pray that someone else happens to drive by. I'm going to make this as short and as clear as possible. If you find any Christmas presents under your tree after Christmas Day that you didn't plant there, call the police. Leave the house immediately and whatever you do, do not open the gift. I lived with my wife Maria and my two young boys in Melbourne, Australia. That's where my wife is originally from, and most of her family lives less than an hour from us. On Christmas Day, we usually have a lot of presents under the tree. Gifts from me and my wife, gifts from grandparents, gifts from the boys, all are placed there. That's why last Christmas, we weren't worried when I found a present under the tree that neither me or my wife had put there. It could have been from one of our parents when they came to visit on Christmas Eve. It could have been from one of the boys. It could have been from many people. And we didn't give it a second thought. It had no gift tag on it. So we decided to leave it there and not open it until we found out who it's for and who sent it. So when I got up on the 26th early to make coffee, that was the only present left under the tree. It was a small box maybe six inches tall and six inches wide, wrapped in bright red wrapping paper. There was a little green bow on top, and it all looked expertly wrapped. But when I came out into the living room that morning, there was something off about that present that I couldn't place. It wasn't until later that I realized the wrapping paper had been completely green on Christmas Day, and it wasn't until later that I noticed that red had leaked on the floor 
around the present as well. Throughout the day, our kids played with their new Christmas loot, as Maria and I called different relatives, asking if they had a little red gift under our tree. As the day went by and more and more family members told us they hadn't sent a gift, we started to get confused. We weren't worried, but we were definitely puzzled. There had been no signs of a break-in or any forced entry, but the gift had to come from somewhere. Mary and I spent the entire day trying to figure it out, and when night came around, we were mentally exhausted. We put the kids to bed and followed soon after. Now I'm usually a pretty heavy sleeper, but something woke me up that night. I'm not sure if it was a noise I heard, or if I just had too much coffee during the day. But I found myself wide awake at 2am, and my throat was dry as hell. I finally slid out from under the covers and slipped into my slippers, careful not to wake Maria sleeping next to me. I walked out of our bedroom to the kitchen, almost slipping on some spilled water on the floor. Muttering a curse, I turned on the kitchen light and poured myself a glass of water from the refrigerator. I stood there in silence for a few minutes, drinking my water, as I leaned against the counter. My mind was occupied with travel plans. We were going to Japan for New Year's, and when I finished the water, I put my glass in the sink and turned around to turn off the light. By chance, I happened to glance over to the hallway that connected to the living room. And that was when I froze. From where I stood, I could see right to our Christmas tree, and I saw that the mysterious present had been opened, and what I had almost slipped on, what I had first thought was spilled water, was revealed to be a trail of bright red blood leading from the open present towards the bedrooms. My body was frozen in shock for a few minutes, but I quickly snapped out of it. I grabbed the biggest kitchen knife we had and I crept over to the hallway, careful not to make a sound. My heart was racing as I followed the trail of crimson back towards the bedrooms, and my blood froze when I realized that it was leading me into the boys' room. I stood outside the bedroom doorway for a moment, trying to build up my courage for whatever waited for me in the darkness. Then I sprang into action, running into the room and switching on the lights in one quick movement. I had tried to prepare myself, but what I saw made the knife slip out of my hand and my jaw drop in horror. My boys had twin beds, one on either side of the room. Micah, the oldest, was on the left side, and Jamie, who was only a year younger, was on the right. I saw Micah first, sleeping soundly and wrapped in his sheets. But when I turned to Jamie, I almost threw up. His sheets had been thrown off the bed, and he was sprawled out across his mattress in an unnaturally rigid pose. His limbs were bent back in ways that no bones should be able to move and his unseeing eyes were open and stared up at the ceiling. Blood covered his pillow, his mattress, everything. Attached to his neck was the most hideous thing I'd ever seen. It was like a cross between a leech and a slug, and was easily almost two feet long and almost a fourth of that in width, and the thing was latched onto his neck. It was smooth and slimy and dark green, almost the exact same color of a Christmas pine. But as I stared at it for a moment, I realized it wasn't attached to his neck. It was in his neck. The creature had torn open Jamie's throat and had burrowed its head into the exposed wound. As I stared on in horror, I saw the thing pulse and writhe as it fed off my dead son's blood and God knows what else. For a cursed minute, I couldn't move. I couldn't even look away. I stared on in frozen horror before I finally tore myself away and stumbled back into the hallway. I knew Jamie was dead without having to check, and I knew that I had to call the police. But I think I was going into shock, because all I could think of in that moment was to stagger into the living room to inspect the present. It was then that I saw the box was logged through with blood, and the top of the box 
had been ripped off by the creature that was held inside. There was something in there that I couldn't make out, which the police later identified as a dismembered hand, most likely put there to feed the creature once the box had been sealed. Yet when I bent down to inspect the box, I saw a small scrap of white paper that was perfectly unstained by the blood. I picked it up with shaky hands, and I was barely able to make out the words written on it in impeccable cursive. This is the gift that awaits everyone on the naughty list. Let it be a warning to you all. Cole is hungry, and he will feed. Merry Christmas. S. C. Code Adam. The voice cracked in mock enthusiasm over the intercom. Forcibly sweet, so not as to raise alarm among the shopping customers. Even so, we could all hear the annoyance in the voice as the familiar code forced us to stop what we were doing and look for a misplaced child. We already had three today, and it was barely noon. Code Adam was the code word we used to alert us to a missing child. Often they were hiding in a clothes rack, waiting for their mom to find them, or sometimes we'd find them in the bakery aisle, happily munching on a box of sweets they'd open and their parents would refuse to pay for. I rolled my eyes and mentally groaned. Honestly, how hard was it to keep track of a whole person? I know that kids are small and sometimes slippery, but they don't vanish into thin air. My coworker Michael walked up next to me and gave me a look that probably mirrored my own. He's a five-year-old boy wearing jeans and a red hoodie, blonde hair and green eyes, white sneakers, Caucasian, and his name is Hunter. Michael repeated to me with a sigh. We began walking the aisles, as did all my numerous co-workers. We checked the bakery aisle, the toy aisle, and checked the clothing racks as we waited to hear the all clear, but it didn't come. Usually we find the kid in under five minutes. Every once in a while, it might take ten minutes if the kid is really well hidden. In the distance I could hear some hysterical screaming and the calming tones of my manager were also joining in. That would have to be the mother of Hunter, yelling at my boss about why it's taking so long to find her precious son. Another five minutes passed, and I was getting annoyed. The kid was either well hidden, or he might have waltzed out the front door in search of whatever had distracted his little goldfish brain. Do you think he got snatched? We should have found him by now, Michael asked moving aside some stacks of paper towels. At this point, we were checking behind everything in case the kid had gotten himself trapped in some tiny space. I don't know. I hope not. I'm sure they'll call the police, and there are security cameras everywhere, I said trying to sound reassuring. More than anything, I was getting more annoyed. This was keeping us all from getting our jobs done, and I refused to stay later than I had to. I wanted to get some online gaming in before my college classes tomorrow. Today was a rare day when I didn't have any assignments due, and I wanted to relax after work. I swore if I ever had a kid, they'd be on a leash the entire time we were out of the house. Thirty minutes had passed before the cops came in the door. Someone had called them, whether it was the store or the kid's mom, I wasn't sure. If my boss called them, it meant the kid probably wasn't in the store, and that brought the fear of kidnapping. The police passed me without a look, and I got a glimpse of Hunter's mother. She was a pretty soccer mom type, but her face was twisted in hysteria and tears had been running down her face, smearing her mascara. In her arms was a cherubic baby girl who, luckily, was not crying, but seemed shell-shocked by her mother's sobs or the situation. One of our supervisors found me and told me to go back to my regular stock shelving duties. Her name was Ashley, and she was actually a pretty nice person and one of my favorite supervisors. There were tears in her eyes, and I knew she was probably worried about the boy. She was seven months pregnant with her first child, so this was probably her worst nightmare made reality. Have the cops found anything yet? I inquired. She shook her head. They're reviewing the tapes now, but I don't know if they found anything. It's going to be okay, Ashley. Maybe the kid just... 
ran out the door and went to the park. The tapes will show what happened to him. I stammered, trying to reassure her. I was never good at around crying women. Ashley smiled at me. Thanks, Roland. You're right. I'm sure it'll be okay. I went on with the day. I was still here for another five hours, and the atmosphere of the whole place was changed. Everyone had a rumor about what had happened to the kid, but the consensus was that he had almost definitely been kidnapped. Two more hours passed before the voice chimed over the intercom. Code Adam? This time the voice didn't carry any hint of annoyance, but rather fear. Even I didn't care about it this time. I really hoped that we would find some chubby toddler chomping on cinnamon rolls they'd stolen. It was better than the alternative. Michael found me again and gave me the child's description. This time it's a girl, Asian with a pink polka dot dress, black shoes, and her hair is in a ponytail. Her name is Daisy. He whispered to me and he looked alarmed. We all dropped what we were doing and we searched the store top to bottom. We didn't find her in the first five minutes or even the first hour. The police were called and once again we heard the sounds of a hysterical parent screaming for their child. When my shift was over, I practically ran to my car. The store was becoming too oppressive and we all walked around with a rising sense of alarm. Having one child kidnapped was terrible but two in one day was some kind of sadistic pattern. When I got home, my mom asked me about what had happened at work. Apparently, word had spread, and even a news crew had appeared outside the store, talking about the two children who had vanished. It was surreal seeing my store on the news, even more so seeing my manager on live TV, talking about how they were working with authorities. I didn't work the next day because of classes, and I was grateful for that. I've never been so happy to study cybersecurity. Michael messaged me around noon, and I opened it, hoping for some good news or at least a funny meme. I was hoping that he'd tell me they found the two kids. Two more were taken today. Twin boys. No one saw anything. That was all the message said. My blood froze, and I didn't bother replying. The next day I worked, and it was like walking into a war zone. Absolutely everyone was on edge. If there were kids in the store, their parents had them in a cart or had a death grip on their hand. My job was harder that day because every second customer came up to me asking if I knew anything about the disappearances. Anything at all. Why was I keeping information from them? My customer service smile was pasted on my face all day as I answered question after question from increasingly angry people. Suddenly over the intercom, the voice spoke again. Code Adam. We didn't find that kid either. It was another little girl. She was turning eight this weekend, and she and her mom were at the store picking up a birthday cake. Her picture was on the news that night, and I was morbidly fascinated by it. She was a cute little girl, and it almost brought me to tears, wondering what some pervert might be doing to her. It felt like a violation as well. Yeah, I might not have had the greatest love for my job, but it was still a place that I was tied to. I had friends who worked there. I knew almost every inch of the store, and the thought of some predator coming into that space and taking an innocent kid was terrifying to me. My parents asked me to quit, but I couldn't. I needed to have a job to pay for gas and my other bills. At least I couldn't quit until I had a new job lined up. Michael told me that Ashley had quit the store. I couldn't blame her. With all the missing kids and her being pregnant, she had more reason to worry. The next day I worked was utterly surreal. The store was basically deserted, for which I was thankful. If I had to describe the feeling there, it was almost post-apocalyptic. Everyone finished their jobs with a manic urgency. The customers who came in for groceries were, thankfully, all adults and they seemed keen on getting what they wanted and getting out. An hour before my shift was scheduled to end, a group of men came into the store, perhaps a dozen in all, wearing camo and a few teen and preteen boys. It made my hair stand on end. They looked serious, and they all spread around the store as if they were on the hunt. Michael found me and gestured to the men. Stay away from these guys. 
Apparently, there's some kind of hunting enthusiasts who've taken to be vigilantes. Some of them are carrying guns under their jackets. The manager already called the cops, he whispered to me. My blood began pounding. Conceal and carry firearms were forbidden in the store. The last thing we needed was some trigger-happy yokel pulling his gun on a customer thinking he was a pedophile. In the distance, I suddenly heard some shouting. My blood ran cold, thinking that someone had pulled out a gun. But then I heard the intercom come to life. Code Adam. One of the sons of the men, who had come in hoping to play hero, had gone missing. The father hadn't been worried about the boy, as he was twelve and strong for his age. According to the dad, his son had a bowie knife stashed in his boot, in case anyone tried to grab him. The next day, the store was closed. They had never done anything like that before, but we all breathed a sigh of relief. I didn't worry about missing out on some money. No kids could get taken if there was no place to take them from. It stayed closed for a week as investigations were carried out. Lots of people were interviewed, but luckily I wasn't. I'm not sure what I would have to say anyway. I only learned about this secondhand. The tapes that would normally show every square inch of the store never showed what happened to the kids. And every tape, each kid seemed to disappear inexplicably into thin air. It was blamed on a weird glitch, though I'm not sure if anyone believed that. Conspiracy theories went crazy, and a lot of the higher-up managers were threatened. People blamed human trafficking, alien abductions, and even portals to another dimension. Someone tried to burn the store down, but they didn't succeed, and they never caught who did it. After that, the corporate types decided that closing the store down permanently was the best course of action. I stayed there during the last days and watched the store go down like some kind of a dying animal. There was one last code Adam. A ten-year-old had come into the store to buy cheap clothes with her parents during the liquidation sale and had not been found. I suppose the fact that the store was packed with bargain hunters had lulled her parents into thinking she was safe. After that day, they closed the store and shipped the inventory off to be sold elsewhere. I never set foot in that place again. Not that I wanted to. I think the parents of the kids who went missing sued the store, but I'm not sure what became of that. It's a few years later now, and I'm thankfully moved away. I have a good job far removed from retail or any big box store. When I visit my parents, I have to drive by that old dilapidated building. It's covered in graffiti, and from the looks of it, someone tried to burn it down again. And that place has become a source of legend to the local kids who live there. Apparently, if you walk up to the walls and press your ear to the decaying cinder block, you can hear children screaming. Thank you for making it this far. I'd like to encourage you to subscribe if you like my content. If you'd like to follow me and want to be involved in what I'm doing slash talk to me, follow me on Twitter or Instagram. If you'd like an offline experience, check out the podcast, The Midnight Podcast. And if you're at all inclined, I've got some merch out there to be purchased if you'd like to support the channel. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you in the next video.